thank you so much for for coming online today to learn how to raise capital. So I met Edmund maybe uh, three, four weeks ago, or maybe a little bit longer. Um, I'm, I was trying to grow my company and we kind of crossed path and having conversations with different Canadians investing in real estate. You know, there's been a common theme that, you know, people are making mistakes, raising capital. And uh, I figured I'd put a little bit of information session and possibly start a mastermind group where we can all kind of work together to achieve the, the, the same goals. And tonight's purpose is just to kind of tell, show you guys how much value uh, Edmund can bring to, to us uh, in terms of raising capital. And uh, I'll let him uh, take it from there, but feel free to write your challenges uh, in the chat box and just interact uh, with each other if you guys have any questions. Um, and then uh, we'll go from there. But again, thank you again for, for joining us tonight. Great. Thank you, uh, Matthew. And uh, I guess uh, just a quick background for those that didn't get a chance to read my uh, bio. I have about 20 years experience in, uh, in investing in real estate. Um, a good portion of that I was doing as a private equity or senior partner at a private equity firm here in Toronto. So I'm born and raised in Toronto. I'm essentially a Bay Street, uh, Bay Street financial professional. I was also uh, IROC licensed. So I was a uh, you know, full-on stockbroker, spent some time at Nesbitt Burns, also spent some time at Sun Life, where I was uh, life licensed as well, and they did a lot of estate planning. So estate planning was very beneficial for family office, so very high net worth families, essentially, and how to do succession planning. So a lot of tax planning, a lot of tax things for uh, high net worth clients. Um, and I guess a, a good way to start is really to make some definitions of some terms that we're going to talk about tonight. So Linda had a question talking about the definition of what an accredited investor is. So what you can do is uh, people can Google either now or later, you can Google accredited investor uh, and OSC. So the OSC will start to mandate what qualifies as an accredited investor in, in Canada. And really it's led off by the OSC here in Ontario. Um, the, uh, an accredited investor, the earliest definition is by income. So somebody who has, I believe it's still 200,000. So $200,000 worth of income um, every year for the past two years. Um, and or 300,000 between husband and wife. Uh, and if somebody has a million dollars in investable assets, so a million dollars does not include somebody's principal residence. So it's fully investable assets in registered accounts in any kind of account, right? That starts to qualify as an accredited investor. So in that space, these are the target investors because we wanna talk about OSC regulations. So SEC is a completely different ball game, but let's just talk about the Canadian, um, the Canadian regulatory system quickly. So there's the OSC is probably the main regulator and then you've got the individual provinces and the regulators and the commissions in the individual provinces. But it mandates that if we're raising capital, we're essentially doing it, if most people are doing it in real estate are doing like real estate syndications, they are creating uh, syndications through an exempt market dealer. So that's another term. If you're making notes, write down EMD or an exempt market dealer. So in order to sell a security, there's a couple of criteria. First off is you've got to sell it to an accredited investor. There are some exemptions to that, which you know we're, we don't want to get into nuances, but for the most part, it's for accredited investors, um, essentially wealthy people who are millionaire clients. And you've got to do it through an exempt market dealer. So you yourself have to be licensed as an EMD specialist or licensed as an EMD uh, qualification. And then the firm that you're clearing your security through also has to be an EMD. That's probably the extent of the legalities that I want to get into tonight. The more thing I want to talk about is probably the more challenging component, which is the soft skills part of things, right? And when we talk a little bit more, we can go more into detail. Like, I guess the legalities are more for a lawyer. It's probably more important that, that they present that to you. My specialty is more of a capital raiser and client facing more of the soft skills. Of how do you find accredited investors? How do you present your value? Uh, how do you go and bring them into a real estate syndication, right? So the mechanics of essentially the sales. So after being in the industry for about 20 years, I functioned uh, much like, or I function now much like, a, uh, much like a branch manager would. So if you're new to the industry, if you entered into finance, if you ended up working at one of the large five major brokerage firms, you'd be mentored by uh, either a branch manager or a senior advisor. And that's the function that I play today. So I've left the industry. I don't hold any licenses anymore. I don't raise capital. I just kind of manage our own personal wealth. And on the side, what I do now is I coach people that aren't, uh, that aren't licensed, that aren't in the industry or trying to get into the industry. And I teach them how to raise or how to be more successful at raising capital for their deals. 
So the first thing to consider, well, and to, to break down when you're raising capital for real estate syndications, there's three sales that you got to make or be able to explain to people. The first sell you've got to explain to the general public is why real estate? So out of all the investments that somebody could invest in across Canada, why should they be looking at real estate? That's the first sell you got to make. And you've got to have a good script and good talk points of it, like, can you basically hang out with people, go to a wedding, uh, go to hang out with your friends and be able to make the case of why they should be interested in investing in real estate. That's the first sell you got to make. The second sell you got to make is out of all the real estate deals that you that somebody can invest in, why should they look at syndications and why should they look at multifamily syndications instead of buying the house down the road or fix and flip? or house hacking, or uh, buying into a REIT? Why is um, getting into a syndication better than those three? That's the second sell you got to make. And in order to collect a check, the third sell that you got to make is out of all the other syndicators that are out there, why should they pick you? Because there's a whole bunch of syndicators. And in fact, I'm, I'm willing to bet there's like what, 38 people here, right? So there's like 30 some odd people, most of you like to say all of your syndicators, out of once you've convinced somebody why real estate, why syndications, now in this room alone, they have probably have 35 options. So out of the entire room, why would they pick you over everybody else? And that's the third sell. So in order to get a check from an accredited investor or from a client, those are the three sells that you got to make. So the first determination to look at is taking your approach. So keep in mind that uh, target investors or accredited investors are all not created the same. They're all different. And they're all at different stages. So it's up to you to develop a sales plan that is unique to you and your organization. And you can have a cutoff of how far do I want to go? So do I want to uh, only talk to people that have already convinced themselves of why real estate? So I'm looking for people that have learned it and they haven't bought a house yet. Or people are house hacking or people are fix and flipping. And they're just getting sick of owning their own individual rentals. And those are the people I want to target. And all I have to do is convince them of why syndications and why me. Or do I only want to deal with people that invest in LPs and invest in syndications? All I need to do now is just you know steal market share and, and explain to people why they should invest in me. That's a determination that you've got to decide. And that's part of your business plan. So that's taking a look at what kind of accredited investor do I want to approach? The next uh, thing to get into that, that I work with people is, taking accredited investors and starting to uh, slice the industry right, of accredited investors. So there's different ranges and it will require, it require different skill sets. So the first part is probably the easiest one to start off with is newly accredited or people who don't know they're accredited, right? And don't realize there's another class of investments that they have access to, that they now have access to. Right? So the mass affluent doesn't get access to these things. They, they're not allowed to invest into EMD projects. So the, 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 I would cl classify those people as people that just have a million in net worth um, to probably about 3 million. And it, that group is similar in their, in their understanding of investments and their skill set. And that requires a certain level of skill on your part and how to, how to find them and how to close that kind of client. The next piece, as you start to migrate past 3 million and you get to 3 million to a $5 million client, you're going to start coming across people with professionals in their lives. So a three to $5 million person is most likely going to have an IA or an investment advisor, a licensed investment advisor that is probably belonging to one of the big banks, right? So uh, one of the big five. Uh, if they're at Dominion Securities, which is RBC, that is the largest brokerage firm in Canada. Right? So they're twice the size of all the other brokerage firms combined. So most of the well-heeled investors, I would typically uh, expect to find them at DS. So if it's like a three to $5 million people, they tend to end up um, at RBC. So once you get past the sort of the $5 million mark, and sometimes you'll even find this in the three to $5 million mark, but I would expect definitely somebody beyond 5 million, there's more professionals in their lives. There's going to be an investment advisor, there's going to be a tax accountant, and there's going to be an accountant. Right. So that is going to require another level of skill. Uh, so each piece or each ladder starts getting more and more. So if you're relatively new to raising capital, my recommendation is, is to start off with the newly accredited because they're already, you know, something that they don't know, which is, you know, they're accredited and uh, sometimes they don't know that themselves. And that's a great way to start off. 
if you try to start raising capital and start trying to bring down a $10 million client, it's quite easy for an experienced guy because you'll be up against a, an investment advisor like me that has 20 years experience. And if you've never raised capital before, I could blow you out of the water real easy. And I can bend the ear of, the, of our mutual client and your prospect, my client, and I can get them to never call you back. And it's just going to start becoming a waste of your time. So it's easy. It's, it's better to start off relatively on the earlier side of things. Um, so the, the first part to do that, that I work with people is start to really hone down and identify the individual that you're looking for. That's the top key to finding an accredited investor. So I'll explain uh, why this works because really high level sales training or very high level uh, capital raising turns into psychology. So here's an interesting thing of how our brain works. Okay, so um, if, if you go and you say you, you go buy a car, this is called the uh, priming the brain. Okay, so when I was uh, when I was working at Sun Life, for an example, you can sell life insurance to anybody who can fog a mirror. If you're 30 days old, you can buy life insurance, and all the way up to like uh, as long as you're like still healthy. So the interesting thing is, a lot of my colleagues when they first started out at, at uh, life insurance, they would say and they would ask people for referrals. Like they would say, hey, well they were at a networking event and they say, hey, what would be a good connection for you? And they would say, you know what, honestly. Anybody, anybody that can fog a mirror. And they, people will look at that and they just don't think of anybody because it's just too, it's too vague. And if you're more specific and you start to tell people, it's like, well, for me, I just picked a, a client. I picked a client base that was really lucrative. And I said, well, my ideal client is a Bay Street lawyer that has at least three years experience in the industry. It's called to the bar. And what I'm basically doing is that, that trick when people say, it's like, oh, don't think of a pink, pink elephant. Whatever you do, don't think of clear your mind. Don't think of an elephant that's pink, that's big and bright and pink. And everybody starts thinking of a pink elephant. It's because that's how the brain thinks. That's priming the brain. So it works for not only just talking to other people to make connections, but it's also good for you in your mind to be able to see this out in society. So people have, have noticed this phenomenon all the time when they go out and buy a car, for an example. So say you go out and you decide you're going to go and, and buy a Mustang. Right. So you buy a red Mustang and you go and sign the, the lease. And then all of a sudden you walk off the lot and everywhere you see these red Mustangs or everywhere you see Mustangs all over the place where you never saw them before. And you didn't realize that the road is just littered with them. So anybody who's bought a car, I'm pretty sure you've experienced this type of thing. It's like all of a sudden I see my car everywhere when you never saw it before. It's because now your brain is primed to see them. Right. Before it wasn't. So it's a really important thing to train and create what we call an avatar profile, which is your ideal client. And it's, it's an exercise that at the first, it's just really rough notes for you. And it's an ability to, for you to train your brain to see them. So I'll give you an example of, of how this works. Okay. So this is one of my, I, I call it one of my magic tricks. And I usually put this behind my paid, paid wall, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to, you know, Jenner say, we'll, we'll do a little trick tonight. Okay. So um, for all of you out there, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to take a second and I'd like you to scan the room that you're in. Okay, and scan the room and look and count all the blue things that you see, right? So only count the blue things, look and see, take a quick second, only blue things. All right, now, once you've counted all the blue things, I want you to close your eyes. All right, so everybody close their eyes. Now, who can tell me how many blue things they saw? Oh, sorry, how many, how many of you could tell me how many red things they saw? All right, so most people can't tell how many red things there are because what you're doing, what you're doing is, is that your, this is psychology, your eyes take in way too much information for your brain to be able to process. So if I'm telling you to focus in on blue things and you're, that's a representation of the busy life that you lead. So you've got somebody telling you to bring groceries home. You've got to remember what time to pick up your kids. You've got to answer your boss. You've got this email to answer. Those are all the blue things in your life and they're distracting you. And red is the accredited investor, is your avatar. And red accredited investors or your avatar are walking by you all day long. And the first thing is, it, to attract accredited investors or find accredited investors is to actually see them. And what you've got to do is train your brain to see those items and create an avatar profile. 
in an avatar profile to review it over and over again. Basically, what you're doing is you're training your brain to say, hey, do not filter these things out. If you see a, you know, this person, this person, this person with this attitude or this person dressed this way, we, I go into a lot of detail um, for my coaching clients of avatar analysis and avatar profile creation. And what you do is you review this over and over again so that anywhere that even if you're distracted, like for now, like I've been doing this for 20 years, I can immediately walk into a social setting and I immediately know who all the accredited investors are. And it's not that hard for me to do because I got well over 10,000, I got 20,000 hours uh, finding accredited investors. It just happens naturally. I can't turn it off. And the, all I do is walk into a room and I just feel it and say, who here looks like my former clients? And I can instantly pick them up with pretty high accuracy. And it kind of shocks some of the people I'm mentoring. It shocks a lot of my assistants that I can do it that well. So that's one of the first tips to look at is really hone down and create a specific avatar. Now, keep in mind, this avatar creation doesn't have to be set in stone. Pick a couple of things, to, like, pick a couple of avatars or accredited investors that you think would be good uh, markets for you. So there's a couple of criteria that you want to look for and looking for a good, uh, a good accredited investor or a good avatar. The first one is, is that, is there a lot of them? And if there's a lot of them, do you have access to them? So there's tons of doctors across Canada, but can you actually get in front of doctors? A lot of doctors. And then the next thing to consider is if there's a lot of them and you can get in front of them, how do they see you when you enter the room? Do you have credibility in that space? So when I first started out in this industry, I, everybody was saying, I was like, oh, doctors, dentists, any kind of healthcare professional. So you know what? I, young Ed, new in the industry, is like, oh, maybe this will be my avatar. So I start writing it down and I start knocking on doors of, of doctors. And I realized that when I walk into to try to talk to a doctor, they're super busy. Um, I can't get their attention. And when I do get their attention, they're all talking down to me because they're all like 20, 30 years my senior. And young 20-year-old Ed had zero effectiveness with, with healthcare professionals. It's like, this isn't going to work. There's tons of doctors out there. Uh, they're incredibly wealthy. They're all accredited. But Ed walking into a room doesn't have any kind of credibility. I can't get their attention. So I pivoted and I kind of switched and I, and I tried different avatars. So that was a bust. Let's go and take a look at a different uh, hole and, and see, what, see what else I can find. And I started to keep digging and digging and digging until I came across, uh, find, interestingly enough, Bay Street Lawyers. So I hit Bay Street Lawyers and I, I kind of liked their lingo and I, I started learning their vocabulary and I started speaking their language. And then I started to empathize and I started to create that connection with them and that bond with them. And but it, it, I realized it became a really good market for me. And that's what I started to, to, to dig down even further. So once you start to get traction in a certain category or, or uh, demographic, the next thing you want to get into is start learning their language or start learn or speaking their language. And I don't mean French or English, right? I mean, speak their jargon. Every single industry has some sort of jargon. And we, we talk in jargon really because, you know, as adults, we're just older versions of who we were in high school. And one of the things that we like to do is when we meet somebody is, is that we want to hang out with people with uh, essentially our same clique. And we want to hang out with people that have the same values as us. And we try to smoke people out by using vocabulary or using jargon of our industry. Now, this is behavioral science. Why does this happen in society? Well, it's a safety mechanism. It's about risk. And in, it starts in high school. Why do cliques happen in high school? It's once again, it's about trying to protect ourselves from bullies. So if I'm by myself and I'm a loner and I have no friends, then uh, I, uh, I, I'm a target for bullies. So I'm trying to find people to hang out with and to start this clique. And the way that I can connect and trust other people is other people that have the same values as I do. So you're going to have the jocks. You're going to have the theater guys. You're going to have the music people. You're going to have the math nerds. You're going to have so on and so forth. And because we bond on this like-minded thing, I find comfort and lower risk because I trust you, because we have the same values. It's essentially, I'm looking for myself because I trust myself. And when I trust myself, my risk of perception lowers. And I need this because I'm looking for protection. That's the psychological thing that starts in adolescence and continues with us into adulthood. So this is a big component that a lot of people miss in capital raising. So one of the things that you get into is when you start capital raising, if you can start speaking their language and if you can start empathizing with them. So empathy is a, a very key core skill in capital raising. If you want to be client facing, empathy is vitally important. And empathy, not to be confused with sympathy, 
empathy is understanding the world from somebody else's perspective and understanding what their pain points are, understanding what it's like to be them. What are they worried about? What are their values? What is important to them? And if you can understand these, uh, these, these uh, core traits that they have and, under and validate them and start to adopt them and explain them and speak their language and build that bridge to them, it will lower that perception of risk for them. It's like, you know what? You seem like you get me. You seem like you understand me. You seem like, you know, you, you understand who I was. So when I started to realize I was starting to make a lot of connections with Bay Street lawyers, I started learning their vocabulary. And what I ended up doing is, is I started to explain con the complex financial concepts in language that they would understand. So one of the things that we have, like in insurance, for an example, we have some, we start off with something called needs analysis, right? So what the hell does that mean? Most people don't understand. Well, if you're not an insurance licensed person, you don't understand what needs analysis is. It's basically under, understanding your financial risk and being able to marry that together with an appropriate, appropriate insurance product or life insurance product. But a lawyer doesn't understand what that means. And when I don't understand what that means, com confusion represents risk. So all I did was I explained to people, I was like, well, the first step I do when I, I work with clients is I do financial discovery, right? So lawyers understand that term. Oh, I understand what discovery means. It means that you want to understand you know, what my needs are and what the, what the issues are. It's like, exactly, right? So that's just one quick example of being able to use their terminology, use their vocabulary to explain the concepts that I want to bring. So... I was talking with, uh, it, it, this can even span different demographics, by the way. So here's an objection that I used to get when I was younger, when I, when I first started out. I'm Asian, of course, so I look like 10 years younger than I actually am. So I was raising capital in my late 20s, early 30s, and I was prospecting a whole bunch of people, and these guys were like old baby boomers. And they would come in, they would say, Ed, that, sounds all, that all sounds great, but you look younger than my kids. And I don't even tell my kids how much money we have. So why the heck should I trust you? And I just kept getting this door slammed in my face all the time. Like, what? Why the hell? And that was one of my challenges. So I figured out, how do I change this? And one of the things that I realized is I got to connect and speak to them. So I had a, uh, and I figured out the answer. I'll, I'll show you in, in how I did it. Like, I came across another young capital raiser. She was from South Africa. And she's female. She's black. She's in her 20s. And she said, our ideal clients in our firm is white baby boomer men. And I can't resonate with them. I can't connect with them. I don't understand what their, what their thing is. And I said, well, when it comes to capital raising and when it comes to sales, it's our responsibility as the client services rep. It's kind of like being a concierge. And it's our responsibility to build the bridge to our clients and, get, and make sure that they feel comfortable in this environment working with us. So I explained to her, is like one of the tricks that you can do or one of the things you should do is start learning their vocabulary and what is important to them. So if it's baby boomer men, for an example, one of the things I started to do is I started to use references that they understood. So I don't talk about references like um, that I understood. So I don't talk about Knight Rider uh, when I was a kid. Like I don't talk about Knight Rider. I don't talk about the music I listened to. I talk about all their music that they listen to. I started talking about the Beach Boys. I started talking about Matlock. I started talking about uh, Andy Griffith Show. Uh, all these different sort of references and popular cultural references from when they were younger, from when they were in their 20s. And they started to understand. It's like, holy crap. It's like that, you know, that makes so much sense. It got to the point where I had one of my clients pull me aside and he said, Ed, you know what? I, I hope this doesn't sound racist or anything, but I kind of forget that you're Asian sometimes. And I didn't get that as, I, I didn't take that as, a, a, as an insult at all. Because what that psychologically tells me is like when somebody's like, you know what, Ed, I, I apologize. Sometimes I forget that you're, you're Asian. It means to me that the way I'm speaking makes them so comfortable that they even forget what I look like because it's like, you seem like me. I feel so connected to you. And I forget that, you know, from a, from a cultural point of view, you, you're, you're not like me, but you don't seem like it. It's because I'm trying to create an environment where you feel comfortable because I'm trying to create an environment where you connect and we're, we're connect back to that high school clique that you and I are one in the same. So I really have to understand where you're coming from. I really have to understand who you are. And that is getting to really, really deep into avatar um, analysis, avatar understanding, what are their concerns? How can I make them comfortable? And how can I get them to, uh, to connect with me? And that a big part of it is to adopt their values, not to push on your values on top of them. So it's building the bridges to those avatars. Um, another big part of avatar analysis now is that's basically the audience that's out there, 
right? So who's your audience? Um, are they, is there a big audience that, that's out there, a lot of good target market? And would they be interested in can you connect with them? And can you get their value? Or can you build that bridge to them? Once you've addressed that, the next piece to consider is what are you going to say to them? What is your value? This is a huge piece. So this is a big part of why you, okay, out of the three cells, all right? So why real estate, why syndications, why you? When it comes to why you, what you've got to create or what I work with clients to create is a unique value proposition, right? So some people call it unique selling, I call it unique value proposition in financial services. What is your value? But the key piece is unique. And I've seen so many investment advisors, so many licensed professionals create these value propositions like, oh, I care about investors' clients. I care. I do the best underwriting. I got the best investment product. You think out of the, you know, out of the, the massive amount of money managers in Canada, you're the only one who cares about clients? Pretty much everybody can say that, right? So that's not unique. There's something that is about you that is unique that nobody else, like if you craft a very concise, unique value proposition, nobody else should be able to steal it. You should be able to tell it to a room of all your competitors and not a single person can take it. That is really unique. So how do you craft a unique value proposition? Well, there's a, a really good book out there. I'll, I'll give you some reading. There's a really good book out there called Blue Ocean Strategy, right? So Blue Ocean Strategy, and you can Google it. Blue Ocean Strategy basically talks about, um, like a red ocean is you have competitors. I try to take your clients. You try to take my clients. We cut each other, cut, 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 and the ocean gets red. Blue Ocean Strategy is creating a value proposition or a premise where once you say it, it renders your competition obsolete and nobody else can steal it. That's a Blue Ocean Strategy. So take a look at that kind of book, read that kind of information, start thinking about to yourself, what unique value can I present? So I'll give you some homework. So we're trying to keep things pretty tight tonight, but I'll give you some homework to consider. If you haven't been able to figure out what your unique value is, the first place to look is, I, I recommend people do an MBTI test, all right? So a Myers-Briggs type indicator. So it's the first step towards a personal SWOT analysis. So SWOT is uh, strengths, opportunity, uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So the starting point of a really good sales plan begins with a personal SWOT. And what is your strengths? What are your weaknesses? Where are the opportunities based on that? And where are the threats? So if you're doing an MBTI test, you can do a free test. So if you just Google MBTI free test, it'll take you to 16personalities.com or something like that. Take the test that's there. It'll spit out one of 16 personalities and give it a read and see if it describes you and if you think it's accurate. And if it is, and it is accurate, then it'll start explaining where your strengths are, where your default strengths are, and where your default weaknesses are. And then start filling that in with your SWOT analysis. And now take a look at that strength and those weaknesses and put it up beside your avatars and saying, is, is this strength of great value to my demographic, to my avatar? Is it something that I can present to them and get the retention real fast? If not, maybe you adjust your avatar. And then it's this perpetual kind of adjustment and change and develop and grow and try something else and try and try to move until you figure it out. This is my absolute strength. And this is what these, my avatars need a whole bunch of and can't find. Once you marry those two up, then you just repeat, repeat, repeat. And that's how you start to really build a private equity firm or, or a firm itself. Um, so Matthew, there's a lot more I could go into, but I think really what we intended to do is um, go for about 45 minutes. So we're kind of like halfway in or 30 minutes into this now. And maybe we can open it up for some questions. Is that is that fair, Matthew? Do you want to do that? Yeah, absolutely. So if you guys want to ask questions, uh, go ahead. Just make sure you, un you mute yourself after, please. Ali, you go first. I know you always have a question. This, this is great. Thanks, Edmund. Uh... Really, really great. I guess you summarized uh, a lot of great information in, uh, in a few minutes. And uh, yeah, to, I guess to implement all that, uh, I, think, I think we'll be way ahead of a lot of <laughs> other people. But yeah, I guess it's, uh, it's harder to implement than that. But um, I was thinking about like what to ask a question. Like I know I always have questions, but <laughs> I guess I might need a few more minutes to uh, to kind right. of wrap my head around the discussion, but the the blue ocean strategy, I've I've heard that before. I I've been meaning to read that book, um, but 
but yeah, I think that that that's a great uh, great strategy that that I've heard. So I was glad to hear that, and I probably have to do the personality test. Yeah, that's great. So uh, there, there is a question in the chat uh, here. It's uh, one of the questions is, uh, do you think uh, what do you think is the best way to cultivate a meaningful and mutually beneficial relationship with a credit investor? So that's a really good point. So and I can talk a little bit more about this. So basically, when you're talking, you're, you're meeting anybody, I think most people are trying to figure out it's like, okay, uh, is this going to be beneficial for me to, to get to know Edmund, right? So one of the things I look at is, Whenever I'm quote unquote selling or trying to raise capital or trying to present a deal, it all comes into this concept of being able to provide value to specifically to that individual and be able to sell that real fast to get the retention. So am I going to be a person of value for you? And if I can show you how I can give you value, I start getting people's attention real fast and then they start drawing in closer. And then once I've given the sort of that teaser and drawn them in a little bit more, then I continue to provide value in every single interaction that I have or every single statement that I make to try to build up that credibility real fast. So that's the process of selling. Uh, basically, what it is, is that when you're trying to present a deal, you're trying to raise capital, you're trying to sell something. So if your ask is, uh, is higher or the, the pain of your ask is higher than your perceived value, you're not going to get a sale. But if I can load up the value quad side of the equation up against my ask and make the ask so small, then sales practically happens on its own. People will sell themselves. So I'll give you an example. So if I told everybody here, hey, I want everybody in this room to write a $100,000 check and send it to me, right? Nobody's going to do that because my ask is really high and I'm giving you nothing. So value is zero. So $100,000, nobody's going to take me up on that offer. But- if I said, I have a million dollar, whatever, a million dollar company, million dollar uh, value, a million dollars, something, right? And all I'm asking for is I need to offload this. I'm a motivated seller. I got to get off. I, I got to sell this million dollar property. And I have to take a massive haircut because I need to sell it by Friday, right? And I will sell it for $100,000. A lot of people, if they have the capacity, will move heaven and earth to buy this million dollar property for $100,000 because the value is so extreme to what the ask is. Right. So whenever you're going in and you're you're doing your trial close, so there's there's really different components to sales. But whenever you're trying to uh, proposition somebody to say, hey, would you be interested in my real estate deal? Would you be interested in you know sending one hundred and fifty thousand dollars check? If people say no, that means that you haven't shown them the big enough value that is above and beyond one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. I would rather hold on to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars than to give it to you who I just met. There's a risk there. So. I, I think that the value of $150,000 cash is more important to me than what you proposed. But if I said, hey, I can show you a 30% return, here's 30 clients that will show you that they've made it in the last three deals that we've done, and we've been investing in real estate for 20 years, there's no risk. Well, you know, we're very experienced in doing this. Would you be interested? Because I can turn your $150,000 in three years or five years into X. And like, holy crap. I don't know you, but the the value that you preside and the the compelling argument that you're making makes me comfortable to let go of like what you offered is more important to me than this hundred and fifty thousand dollars I have in my hand. I'm willing to give it to you. So it's this exercise of understanding what is more important than your ask. And once you figure that out for your avatar, then sales start becoming incredibly easy. So that's sort of helpful for people. We ask any other questions? I can give you some other tips too, if not. There's one that just came in the chat there. Ed is awesome. Hello, Ed. Question. Where do I find newly accredited investors for U.S. market? So are you trying to raise money in Canada or from U.S. investors? Okay. So that, this is a really interesting point. So and I want to clarify this. If, you're reside, if you reside in Canada, it's, uh, you've got to be licensed in your province as an EMD. And it is imperative that you do not talk to uh, American investors. It's illegal to talk to American investors unless you get, uh, unless you're qualified or unless you get under, like you're basically going to put yourself under SEC regulations. And they do not look kindly to foreigners prospecting American investors, right? So it starts getting into a lot of legalities. So when I was licensed in Canada uh, as an EMD at first, 
we could not talk to Americans. We only talked to Canadians and only talked to Canadians in our province or the provinces that were licensed in. Same goes for IROC, and, uh, IROC investment advisors. So when I was an IROC advisor, can only talk to the, uh, the Canadian investors in my own province. So part of the thing is, how do you find these accredited investors? Well, the first part is being able to, to define what kind of accredited investor you're looking at. There's, there's hundreds of thousands of different types of accredited investors. So if you look at newly accredited, are you talking to, uh, like what industry do they work in? Are they entrepreneurs? Are they, uh, uh, are they articling students? Are they first year associates uh, in law? Are they medical professionals? Are they IT professionals? And a big part of it is, do you have access to them? Right. So are you in Waterloo and do you hang out a bunch around a whole bunch of IT professionals? Take a look at your contact list. All right. So everybody that, you know, all your friends and family, everybody that, you know, and then start splicing and all the people I know, who do I think are accredited? And that's the first piece to take a look at. Now, out of the piece of who do I think are accredited? Who do I think are newly accredited? So who do I think are in the million to maybe two million category in, in net worth? And, uh, and in that segment, start to focus in. And is there kind of pattern that I have? The people that I know that are in this category, is there a specific industry that I find that they're in? Are they all you know, Bay Street advisors? Are they all you know, doctors? Are they all construction people? Are they all entrepreneurs? Is there any kind of pattern that's there? And then once you figure that out, then you figure out where do they hang out? Where do they go? Where do they get their investment advice? So who do they talk to? Do they look at blogs? Do they, uh, do they read newspapers? Where do they get their information from? And start reading the same information they do and start learning how they receive investment information, right? So if they're technical people, then start watching BNN and start watching uh, CNBC and start learning how to talk like them if that's what they do and that's what they listen to all the time. And then that, they'll start to sound like what they expect a, a professional to sound like, a financial professional to sound like. So it all comes down to who is your avatar, where they hang out, and how do you get in front of them, and how do you get their interest? Is that helpful? Yeah, I think Albert's got a question. Albert, you want to unmute yourself and ask a question? Thanks for putting me on the spot, uh, Matt. Um, if, uh, just, uh, I had the same same uh, same feeling as Ali, where where there's a lot of information, very interesting information. Uh, you touched on something that that was uh, also interesting right now when when you talk about uh, being able to approach only the people in the province that you are um, uh, accredited or what, what so you have to be an EMD in order to talk with with these people uh, that are accredited investor and second question can you be in multiple province like we are on the border of Quebec and in Ontario. So, so if, if we would like to go from one side to the other, we'd need to be accredited in, in two uh, provinces. Yeah, so that's a very good question, Albert. And keep in mind, I will, uh, d big disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not a securities lawyer, but I will tell you like the, from what I've learned from years of compliance and years of compliance training, right? So the rules change, but back when I was licensed, the regulations were uh, you have to be your firm that you're clearing your securities through has to be an EMD and you also have to be registered as an EMD and they're done by province. So as far as I understand, if you want to raise capital in other provinces, you've also be, have to be licensed in those provinces as well. So you can be uh, you can raise capital in different provinces. It's just you have to be registered in all those jurisdictions and it increases cost, right? Because you've got to pay your annual fees, all this type of stuff. I don't know if the firm has to be licensed uh, in yeah. there as well. I would hazard a guess to say probably that the firm also has to be licensed in those provinces as well. That was my follow-up question. So, so, okay, thanks. Right, so very challenging. So, and I think that it gets really complex if you wanna go south of the border and you start getting into multiple jurisdictions, you start getting, um, you start getting regulated by the OSC, the SEC, and everybody's looking at you and you're, you can potentially get under a microscope. So I'm not a big fan of looking at that. But once again, I'm not a lawyer. I'm sure that there are potential lawyers that I can get connected with. I'm, I know, of course, a lot of Bay Street financial lawyers that might be able to come up with a solution for you, but they tend to be pretty expensive as well. So my suggestion would be is if you, unless you've got a well-built sort of private equity firm around you, start with just doing it locally then start doing it or pick one or two provinces and start registering yourself there and then raising capital and start mastering that first before you start hitting bigger markets. Because yes, 
Uh, America is 10 times as big, but it's also 10 times, if not more, competition. So if you try to go on Wall Street and you raise capital, it like even a Bay Street person trying to go to Wall Street will can be eaten alive by the sharks there. You gotta be incredibly sharp and really know your stuff if you got to go to the if you want to go to the US. Ryan's got a good question here um, in the chat. Can a Canadian partner with an American who is the person contacting other Americans regarding investments? Can a Canadian partner with an American who is the person contacted them? Okay, so once again, I think that that's more of a, a legal question that's beyond me, and I don't want to steer you wrong. It's probably best to ask a, a, a securities lawyer for that one. All right, so we got another question here by Kyle. Uh, if you, in your previous example, speaking with a potential accredited investor, you're openly uh, mentioned a thirty percent return. Where is your comfort level with putting such numbers on the table, disclosure records, meaning, et cetera? Okay, so that is more about um, the, the specifics of a particular project, right? So I just randomly spit out a number, right? 30% return. It really depends on what kind of deal that you're presenting. So, and that's an interesting point is that when you talk to an accredited investor, and this goes back into empathy, what are other deals that they're looking at? Because I assure you, you're not the only person that they're looking at, right? So if I look at a deal and I say my, my project is pro providing 8% cash flow, I have to know that what else is my investor looking at? So if he's gonna go and, and talk to his investment advisor, what are the average REITs, that, what are they paying out right now into a registered account, for an example? Um, how do I fare? So there's a, um, there, there's a, a really good uh, book out there. It's an ancient book. It's called Sun Tzu, The Art of War, right? And it, it's got a lot of business applications. So there's one concept in Sun Tzu, The Art of War, which is know yourself, know your enemy, and know the terrain. And that's essentially what I kind of teach in, in business capital raising, which is know yourself, so know your project, know what your, what your IRR is, what your annual return is, and what your cash flows are. And that's knowing yourself and your value. But then at the same time, know your enemy is know your competitor. What is everybody else presenting? So not just real estate people, but what is the average investment return? So if an IA was taking a portfolio, what is the average investment return that they're calculating right now to retirement? So in, in, are you above that? So that's knowing your competitor. Who else are they talking to? And then the third is know the terrain. Know the terrain is know the client, right? What are clients looking for? Why would they be interested in talking to you? Are they frustrated with the banks? Are they frustrated with you know, typical investments and are now looking to alternative investments? Or are they completely happy with it? And you've really got to go up a high wall to convince them of why they should be interested in alternative investments in, in real estate. Right. So that's understanding the, uh, the value that you provide. So the, the number return is, is really just arbitrary in, in my example, but it's when you know your, your project and you know the, the returns that you have, understand how you fare compared to other projects that that person's looking at. There's a question here um, from uh, Lisa. Uh, do, you, do you have different advice for raising funds for like a GV partnership equity split versus straight promissory note? Okay. So all of those things are very complex uh, financial project uh, 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 financial vehicles. So P, P notes, uh, JV partnerships, all these different types of things. I think that it's more important to, to understand this. When you're raising capital from accredited investors, here's a, a big way to differentiate yourself. So if you don't have any experience in raising capital or you don't have any experience in sales, the number one mistake that I see people make is the difference between features and benefits, right? So this is something you got to write down, features versus benefits, right? So features is something that you would be able to read off of a prospectus or be, be able to read off an executive summary. It's just the, the returns or the mechanics of how something works. So if you're like interviewing for something, basically all you're doing features would be all of your credentials on your resume or on your LinkedIn profile. And you just read that down. It is unemotional. It's very technical. And in this type of project, for example, you can get into the nuts and bolts of these financial products, right? And try to compare them. And here's the biggest thing when it comes to raising capital and why features are different. I'll explain the difference between, sorry, why benefits is so much more important. It's because benefits are something that define the feature that evokes an emotional response or emotional connection with the client's needs. 
All right. So there's a, a really good adage that's out there that, that I teach people, which is logic will get people to think. Emotion will get people to act. And when you're raising capital, you need people to act, not just think. So there are some requirements and minimal disclosures that you need to make. You have to explain how things work, but a lot of people will make the mistake of diving into too much in the technical. And there's a point when you bring in the technical to pivot to benefit of why they should care about this thing, right? So I'll give you a, I'll give you a quick example. I hope that we're not going to run out of too much time here, but I'll, I'll end off with this big example to really define the difference between features and benefits. So I use the example of Apple computers. So when Apple computers launched the, uh, the iPod, Steve Jobs came out and presented the, uh, the iPod, but he did it in a completely different way. So Steve Wozniak is a very technical guy at Apple, right? He loves transistor. He's, a, he's basically this, this engineering nerd. So if you got Steve Wozniak to present the iPod, Steve Wozniak would come out and he would say all the features. He would come out and say that we use the lightest, uh, the, the lightest hard drive. It's this fast. We use these resistors. We use the minimal amount of resistors. We have the fastest motherboard. We got the lightest screen, all the, and it's black. Those are all features. So the audience will look at it as like, oh, that's cool. Maybe the, the engineering types in a crowd would be interested, but the general public don't care. So how did Steve Jobs do it? He tapped into what we call the features and why it's important, or well, he tapped into the benefits and why it's important to the audience. So Steve came out in his, you know, in his, in his very famous, you know, black, you know, black turtleneck. It's a stage. There's this big spotlight. There's some smoke, and he comes out and he goes, "You know what, folks? I want everybody here to close your eyes for a second, and I want you to think about all the music that you have in your house, all the music that you own. So all the CDs, all the all the LPs, all the all, all the vinyl, all the tapes, every single song that you own." And I want you to think of some of your favorite songs. And I want you to imagine what those songs mean to you. And now I want you to think of a world where you could have every single one of those songs in your pocket with you right now. That world does not exist until now. Open your eyes. I present to you the iPod. Didn't talk a thing about resistors and features. 100%, it was all about benefits. Why should I care? He created a need that we didn't even need, knew we needed a need back then. And it was revolutionary. And people were like, holy crap. So how does Apple computers, which is a computer company, how do they get people to line up outside of their store the day before something's launched? There's no other computer company that has done it to that extent. How many have stood in front of a, an HP store, a Dell store before that, before they launched their product? Nobody does. Like Apple, people follow, and it's a computer company, but people don't see it that way because they're talking about the benefits of how they change society and how their product changed society. They don't sell computers, they sell benefits. This is how we're gonna change your life. And if you can tap into that benefit and explain why you have value and the value that's important to your client and the, and the benefit that will happen because they know you and the benefit they'll get when they write you a check and the way that you'll change their lives, that $150,000 or whatever your ask is seems minuscule compared to what you're gonna give them back in value. And it's an emotional response. Once you do that, then raising capital becomes a lot easier. Awesome. Awesome. Maybe we finish, um, we'll just finish it with the Ali's question there. To present value to the, uh, to the prospect investor, how do you identify their needs, wants, so you can speak to them? That comes into this exercise of understanding your avatar. So once you address and identify a particular avatar uh, profile, then start to get to know them really well. So I, over my 20 year career, I started to identify multiple different avatars and I know them quite well. So I work with a lot of my clients when somebody says, oh, uh, this is, I think this is my avatar. There's after, of course, 20 years or two decades, there's very few accredited investors where I don't know them really well. So I can immediately tell you, these are probably their pain points. And then you just test the market. Is this one of your pain points? Is that one of your pain points? Or if you don't know, it's like, tell me if you get one of your avatars that you can uh, establish a connection with and they're willing to tell you about themselves. It's like, tell me what keeps you up at night. Tell me what you're worried about. If I could solve one of your biggest financial problems, what would it be? I can't promise that I can, but tell me what that is. And just start writing all these things down. And the more yet you start to talk to the like-minded people in that one demographic, you'll start to see a pattern. You'll start to see them say the same thing over and over again. And once you start to do that, you can now walk into a room of that demographic and say, hey, let me see, your biggest worry is this. And I've been able to do this. So I, I, I shock, it's like, it's like a magic trick. I come into, and people don't realize it because I've been talking, like I had a whole bunch of entrepreneurs in construction. 
and they were incredibly wealthy. So I did it for so many years. I walk in and I talk to a brand new owner of a construction company and I can come in and say, let me, let me guess, one of your biggest problems is this. And their jaws just drop the ground. It's like, are you in construction? How did you know that? And it's like, are you a mind reader? And it's like, no, I'm just in sales. Of course I'm a mind reader. But it really comes down to it's a lot of experience and going through the pattern. So if you're in construction, I know that these are probably some of your major worries. And I'm usually right because I spent so many sampling and I've talked to them for so much. So get to know your avatar very well. Awesome. That's awesome value tonight, uh, Edmund. I really appreciate that. So on a second note for this, um, we're trying to put together um, a mastermind. Um, and you guys can see all the, the value that Edmund can bring to the table about raising capital. So what we're thinking about doing is doing it bi-weekly. And people feel free to, to, to hop on the chat uh, for your feedback. Um, so we're thinking about doing it twice a week, uh, twice a month, sorry. So there'll be a teaching lesson from between 45 minutes to an hour and then a half an hour worth of questions. And in between each uh, session per month, there'd be definitely some homework in between. And we're, we want to offer that for $2,500 for kind of a group coaching um, to a maximum of 20 people at once. Um, and the recording of the sessions will be available. And I'm not too sure if anybody uh, has any feedback on that if they're interested, but we will send a, a separate email um, on that but do you guys um would like to participate in doing it bi-weekly or do you guys want to do it like one two-hour session at a time that's the one thing that we're deb debating uh, internally uh, how to do it because there's a lot of uh meat and potatoes to go through when you're when you're raising capital yeah there, there's a lot that we can cover there, there's so much that cover i can't really you know cram it into 45 minutes and when it comes to it's like trying to teach people how a swiss watch works right in, in 45 minutes it's just it's just way too much so we do have a, a program and just to give some perspective i do one-on-one -on -one coaching now most of the times most of my clients are, are u.s clients right so after i left the industry and I, I took all my licenses down i can now talk to the u.s so i mostly teach americans how to raise capital for real estate syndications so for them or for, for people, I do one-on-one -on -one coaching and my hourly rate is um, $575 an hour, Canadian, right? So, and I work with them on a, uh, on a six month basis, one hour a week, every week. So that's 24 sessions. So that's basically, uh, I do it for 13,800 in US clients. And I, I pretty much have a, almost a full roster right now of, of that. So that's kind of the things that I, that I do. But I was speaking with Matthew and Matthew was uh, kind of looking, I was like, well, I, I don't know if, if people have the ability to hire me at one-on-one -on -one for, you know, for almost $14,000. Uh, so we're, we're going to start to create, or I'm, I'm open to creating a mastermind on, on Matthew's uh, request. And we're looking at uh, like the, the format that he was talking about and then be able to sort of break it down for people and give you all those kind of steps. So some of the things that we didn't cover tonight that I still think are really important that I'll, that I'll go into some of the things is like, how to, instead of going out and prospecting for accredited investors, how to get accredited investors to come to you. So it's one of the major things that we do in, in capital raising. So instead of always pounding the payment and trying to find people, how do you get people to come to you where it's, uh, it's basically just passive and it's, it's, it takes a little while, but it's doable. And how do you get known and people start coming out to you? How do you raise capital also while you're sleeping? So how do you go out and find other people uh, that that just get sent to you and not using social media, all right? So I'm not a social media guy. It's And I know a lot of people try to tell people, you know, you got to use social media, but there's another way that you can do it. And this is essentially how Bay Street does it, okay? So Bay Street does not use raise capital from accredited investors using social media. So I'll tell you the secrets of how they do it because I used to do it myself. And in fact, I teach people how to do that. Also, how to find, create, and build family offices. So how to get in front of family offices. So family offices are essentially incredibly wealthy families. How do you get noticed by them? How do you attract them? And how do you build those? And how do you build family office management? So it's also things like increasing your closing ratio. So if you've got a whole bunch of accredited investors, how do you make sure that you don't you know, botch a lot of those, those calls? And how do we make sure that we close more of the meetings and the pitch meetings that I have? Right. So those are all some of the things that I think that are, are very pertinent. And of course, there's other things that we can cover. I got 20 years of experience. So any kind of direction or, or road that you want to branch off of that's unique to your situation, we can go down those roads as well. Another question just popped up too. You know, there's, there's definitely a legal component to it too. So we, we're probably end up bringing in a, a lawyer, uh, a Bay Street lawyer, one of Edmund's friends uh, 
to come on board to kind of go through the legality portions of it. Um, but he'll be, uh, so there's definitely going to be a, a legal component to it for sure. So th that's an interesting point, Kyle. And, and I would agree with you. It's like, if you guys are interested and you want a, a special speaker to come in and talk about the legalities, there's a number of different Bay Street firms that I could present. Um, so I do have connections in securities law at, at Miller Thompson, as well as, uh, as well as Fask and Martineau. So some of the top two, those are my go-to law firms. There's a couple of others that I can go to as well. But if you're interested and we, you'd like to have a special evening that with, uh, with some legal professionals or with a legal professional, I can certainly tap them and bring them in. All right, guys. So if you guys have any more questions, the last time uh, we, we'll we'll do some networking, uh, and then I'll send you guys an email with the recording in the next two three days. Um, so so yeah. So the course the the program would be basically for six months. So it's a six months commitment, and then uh, we'll look at everything after the six the six month uh, commitment. So yeah, yeah so, thank you. So, so the, we're, we're thinking about, we're still working the back end of it. So we might create a Slack channel for everybody to communicate, maybe a closed uh, Facebook group. Uh, we haven't figured it out, but I think uh, the best channel for this will probably be using a, a Slack channel. I started using it for, for my business a couple of weeks ago and I love it. So, all right. Well, thank you so much again, Edmund, uh, for coming on today. And uh, if you guys want to stay on, we can all network and go from there. Yeah, I'm just going to put my uh, my LinkedIn. Um, I have it here. I'll, I'll put my LinkedIn contact in the in the chat and people are welcome to, to connect with me as well. And actually, one more question, actually, before you, you sign off there, Lisa's got a good one. I'll let you answer that one. Who's the ideal person for this mastermind? Um, I would say that the ideal uh, ideal profile of somebody is somebody who is interested in raising capital. Uh, in Canada, specifically for real estate, right? And uh, you've either, you've done some underwriting courses or you've done some real estate courses and you've uh, you've realized that you want to go in and assist with raising capital. So uh, that's an interesting point is one of the distinctions I wanted to make uh, that you've got to make a decision on is in, pri in the private equity world, there's two sides to the house. There's the asset management side and then there's the capital raising side. And it's it's kind of like playing offense and defense. And you've got to specialize and pick a side because once you start going pro, you're going to be up against people that do it full time. So I was a full time capital raiser in investor relations. And so if you take a look at yourself and that's part of your MBTI and SWOT analysis, are you going to be more valuable on the asset management side and prospecting for property? And are you a numbers analyst or are you an extrovert and you know, really personable? You really like hanging out with people. You like raising capital, all that type of stuff. And then if you think that that's your default advantage, that would be a, a, a default advantage in the capital raising component of things, right? So I would encourage you is like, it's for people that are started to go down that road to realize, hey, I wanna be a capital raiser. I think I'm gonna be a great capital raiser or analysts that wanna know what that side's like, even though they like, I, I can spend that money. I just wanna learn a little bit of what happens on that side of the house, but I don't necessarily wanna do it. If you just wanna learn about it too, I'll be happy to teach you. Awesome. All right, guys. Yeah, Lisa, that's great. That, that's a great connection, right? So working with an asset manager, and it's great for them to sort of trust you and, and know what's going on. And you realize I'm the extrovert and I like to be the capital raiser, but I hate managing. That's me. I hate managing money. I hate, you know, asset management. I just let the other people do it. I just go and manage the relationships. All right. So thank you again for coming on and uh, I'll email everybody. And then if you guys want to stay on, we can do a little bit of network and, and go from there. So, all right. Thanks again, Edmund. I, mean, I know you got some stuff tonight, but uh, I appreciate everything. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Once again, folks, feel free to reach out um, and uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be around. Take care, Matthew. Thank you. All right, bye. Thank you.